or might trickle in, but that's fine. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event entitled Breaking into the Vancouver Job Market. It's held in partnership between Vancouver Public Library's Skilled Immigrant Info Center uh, and WorkBC. So my name is Kelty Roberts, and I'm the coordinator of VPL's Skilled Immigrant Info Center. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're operating on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I'd also like to say at this time that this event is funded in part by Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, as well as by Welcome BC. So just a few logistical pieces before we get started. First, this event is being recorded so that those who aren't able to attend will be able to watch it afterwards. Second, please feel free to use Zoom's Q&A function uh, to ask questions. There will be dedicated time at the end of the session uh, to address any questions that you enter in the Q&A uh, function. Uh, and lastly, as we are uh, funded by Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, we do ask that you kindly take a moment to fill out our intake uh, form if you, if you haven't already done so, you may already have done so. Uh, my colleague's gonna put the link in the chat right now. Um, and we do keep this information confidential and secure. Uh, the only reason we ask for it at all is so that we can continue to put on events, uh, to receive funding to put on events like this. So I'm gonna see if I can get to the next slide. Um, today you're gonna hear from our panel of employment experts uh, about how to break into Vancouver's job market and work towards the career that, you're, that you want. So I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists, uh, Heidi Henkenhaff, a librarian with VPL's Skilled Immigrant Info Center, and Kristen Fountain, a case manager at Vancouver South's WorkBC Center. Uh, Heidi and Kristen, would you like to say a few words about yourselves before we delve into the discussion questions? Sure, I can go first. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the program. My name is Heidi Hakenhoff. I am a librarian with the Vancouver Public Library. I've been working with the Skilled Immigrant Info Center for the past five years. Uh, the Skilled Immigrant Info Center is a career, is a free, like all resources at the library are free, so I want to put that out there. And the Skilled Immigrant Info Center is a free career job search and small business resource center. We have an in-person um, space located on the fourth floor of the big central library at 350 West Georgia street in Vancouver and we also have our resources online for easy and convenient access so um, I hope that you'll learn a little bit more about those today but you can always touch base with us and we can put some contact information up at the end. Thanks Kristen did you want to have a, a few words? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kristen, and I am a case manager at uh, WorkBC. Um, I am at the uh, South Vancouver branch, um, but there are WorkBCs all across the province, um, so there's probably one in your neighborhood if you want to check them out. Um, what we do here at WorkBC is uh, we give you the skills that you need to uh, find work. So whether that be help with um, resume, interview skills, cover letters, um, you know, whatever, um, yeah, whatever skills that you need in order to help you uh, find a job. So that's what we do at WorkBC. It's a free service as well for anyone who wants to come by. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heidi and Kristen. Um, so I'll start, I'm going to stop screen sharing. And I'm hoping everyone can see a uh, speaker view so that we can see who's talking. Um, and I'm going to start us off with some panel discussion questions. So the first question I have is, uh, for you two, is, is there anything unique about Vancouver's job market as compared to other parts of Canada or elsewhere in the world? Okay, so... Um... Just one sec. Um, so I just want Hold to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll just get started. Yes, please. So, um, yeah, so what's unique about Vancouver's uh, job market as compared to other parts um, in Canada? Uh, I think one of the big surprises to people, to newcomers, and even to others, is that in um, Vancouver and BC, so much of the job search is, can, is related to networking. So networking in the hidden job market. If you don't know this, uh, 
as 20, about 20 to 25% of jobs are advertised and about 25 to, you know, so 75% to 80% of jobs are never advertised. And so that makes networking uh, really important to learn about what's happening in your profession and in your industry, specifically here in BC and connecting with people. And so I think that's what's something that really surprises people when they, um, about Vancouver. Um, another thing that I think is important to note is that um, there's uh, a lot of uh, competition sometimes for um, certain positions. And um, so it's really um, important to just be patient um, and to just, um, you know, be aware that you will probably have to submit several resumes before you get any um, kind of callbacks or um, sometimes hear anything um, from employers. So it's just, you know, making sure um, that, uh, you know, you're just able to market yourself really well um, and just making sure that uh, you have a lot of patience um, that it'll take time. For sure, thank you so much. Um, are there any other specific elements of the Canadian workplace culture uh, that you think newcomer job seekers may not be aware of? Um, I think one of the biggest things that um, a lot of new immigrants uh, don't realize is that uh, here a lot of companies use a scanning software um, called the ATS. And uh, basically what it does is when you apply to a job online, um, they have a computer software that scans um, your resume. And so it's really important to um, have your resume in the right format so that the scanning can, the scanner can read it. Um, because what happens is a lot of times people are submitting resumes in different formats um, and it's not being read by the scanner. And so they don't, they feel frustrated because they're not getting calls back. Um, but a lot of times it's just from the resume. Um, so that is something that um, one of the workshops that uh, we do here at WorkBC is just explaining how to format your resume and how to pull the keywords from the job posting and making sure they're in your resume and in your cover letter to, uh, to get it uh, picked up. Yeah, and so, something um, that I would add to that too is just to when you're talking about formatting the resume in the um, correct format for that, for applying online. Also remember that Canadian style resumes might be different than what you're used to. Um, so explore that, get help from WorkBC. And um, of course the library VPL, we have lots and lots of resources. Again, books about writing Canadian resumes and I've talked about the Skilled Immigrant Info Center. We also have um, job search uh, resources guides and one is specifically all about writing resumes and cover letters in the Canadian format. And um, which means you wouldn't uh, put a picture on your resume. You do not put your family um, information on your resume. No family, like what your parents' name is or um, whether you have children or not, or um, your marital status, all that religions, all that personal information will, is not on your resume. And I know that's different than other countries. We also do have a workshop that talks about that VPL that talks about the Canadian workplace culture and communications as well. So. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is, newcomers often experience challenges finding a job because they don't already have Canadian work experience in their field. Do you have any tips on how to overcome this barrier? One of the biggest things that uh, I would recommend is to uh, volunteer um, uh, somewhere in an organization in your field. Um, and it's not, you know, it's some people, uh, you know, say, well, volunteering is working for free, but it's really not 
you know, working for free. It's where you are gaining exp Canadian work experience um, because it's something that you can put on your resume. Um, you are also gaining Canadian references as well that can be able to, um, you know, speak to your good work that you're doing. Um, and it's a way to also connect with other individuals um, in in your field to network to um, you know just just make those connections and um, it's really really a great way to um, get that Canadian experience and references on your on your resume for sure. Yeah, and I think we're going to talk a lot about uh, networking and how and how volunteering is a really important part of networking. Uh, a lot today and uh, there was even a question in the chat about you know how is 50 percent of if are 50 percent of jobs um gotten by by networking and by meeting people and and as i mentioned earlier and i think that kristen would agree with me on this is that um it's probably more than that it's probably closer to 70 percent and maybe even 75 percent so the networking will be important and and of course volunteering is one of the big ways that people get that networking event get that they'll get connections in the community to network one of the tips i do tell people is sometimes if you're applying for a big corporation and um you know a lot of the big corporations a lot of not even big even like other companies they um a lot of them have their preferred their preferred um charities and so you can even find out on their website what their preferred charities are and then you could volunteer for those charities as well just you could just make that your priority um so and it would be you know a connection when people see your resume again that would be another connection if I volunteer for the United Way or I volunteer for this organization that's part of the United Way or something like that, for example, that could be a trick. So on top of the volunteering, but other forms of networking for sure would be connecting with your professional association. So often your professional association, you, um, you know, you have a choice to join or not, unless you're, we're going to get into that later, I think, but um, professional associations often have uh, net, have um, like networking evenings and, and get togethers. So those are good places to go and meet people and who are in your profession and, and get your face out there to people, especially now that we're meeting in public again. Again, job fairs. Now a lot of those have been online recently, but again, it's a really good idea to um, go to job fairs, connect with people, and then you can follow up with them using social media afterwards, LinkedIn and and Facebook and, and um, other social media forms. Uh, having said that, LinkedIn, of course, is a great um, social network to be connecting with people. And uh, so these are all tips to overcome that barrier, like how do I meet people without knowing anyone here often? Uh, and then we're gonna talk, I think, about information interviews and how important that is. And just to let you know, again, <laughs> plugging BPL and that Skilled Immigrant Info Center, <laughs> we have um, a, a, a once a month, we have a two hour program and it is um, networking in the hidden job market. So it's a two hour program, uh, networking in the hidden job market. It's, it happens once a month. And I encourage you to go to all of these. Like I know WorkBC has a lot of these great programs as well. And, and Kristen is probably going to talk about those. And, you know, there's other organizations. I encourage people to go to, to multiple ones, like go to both. Because, you know, what, what WorkBC's focus is on is on different um, aspects of the job search and, and the Skilled Immigrant Info Center. We don't do what WorkBC does. Uh, we promote, we support what they do. So they are career counselors at WorkBC. And so they give you advice and direction and we give you the support to follow through on that direction and that advice. So that's what, so that's why I say, you know, even though some of our programs might have similar titles, I encourage you to do both because you'll get, um, you know, might get a little bit, not, we'll get complimentary, we get complimentary information. Yeah, I was just 
Um, I was just actually going to mention we uh, one of the workshops that we um, offer here at Work PC. Um, we have a couple of different ones on uh, LinkedIn and social media, and uh, just you know where you could come and learn how to set up your LinkedIn account, what kind of information you should have on there, and just kind of also how to uh, promote yourself on social media um, to get noticed um, by employers. So. Those are really good workshops that I recommend people attend. Thank you. That's great advice. Um, do you have anything else to add or shall I move on to the next question? It, it's a bit of a tie-in because um, so Heidi brought up informational interviewing is, is a valuable networking strategy um, and particularly for job seekers that are trying to market themselves. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about this technique and how to do it effectively. We got some feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, information interviews are um, are meetings that you request from people working in your field, and um, and you gather information and advice that can be helpful for your job search. So, um, information interviews can help you target your resume, so you can get information from people who who work in your industry or work in your um, even your profession or even generally your industry. It doesn't have to be specifically your profession, just to help you with your um, developing your resume, talking, using those keywords that Kristen talked about earlier for writing your resume. You'll be just getting familiar uh, with the language that's used in your in your um, industry and in your business. It, it'll also help you write your cover letter. You can even ask people specifically about what kinds of questions, like what kinds of information you need in your uh, cover letter. You can ask, um, you know, even get ideas about interviews, you know, what kinds, what's industry standard and, and, and some of the information that you'll get during your information interviews can also be, um, can also be used for that. Um, and of course, you're expanding your, your network. So it's uh, information interviews are normal here in BC. So I think that's really important to know that so that if you think it's uncomfortable for you, I want you to know that that, that is very common. People do do information interviews. It's not uncommon for professionals to be asked about doing an information interview. And so, yeah. So that's kind of for all those yeah. industry resumes, cover letters, interviews, just learning about your industry. Absolutely. I highly recommend doing uh, informational interviews. Um, just a couple of things to add to that. Um, it's also important to remember that um, it's not the informational interview is not about you going and asking for a job. It's about you going and um, making connections with employers and about learning about the industry and learning about, you know, um, you know it, it's perfectly acceptable to ask them, like, how did you, uh, you know, how did you uh, end up working uh, in this field and what kind of led you to this, right? So you can kind of, it, it, it's more about fostering that relationship than it is about uh, directly asking for a job. And with that, it's important to um, have done your research um, and know, uh, you know, be strategic about who you're talking to. Um, so making sure that when you're going to do an informational interview that, you know, you're talking to someone, um, you know, who, um, has maybe been in the industry a long time, who is well known in the industry or, or at least in, in that organization, right? And you can find out a lot of that information um, on platforms such as LinkedIn and social media and things like that. So um, it's important to just, uh, yeah, to just kind of look at it as a networking um, opportunity and just get to know um, just get to know them and their, their journey and how they ended up there and just, uh, see, uh, you know, ask if they have any tips or advice or things like that. Yeah, I, that's to build on that. I think that's um, great advice that you're going to do an information interview and even just asking people about uh, their journey. If I think that's important because sometimes people, when you're asking for information interviews, you, you can get a lot of no's because, and sometimes that's because people think that they don't have anything to offer. Like, they think, well, I'm not that engaged with my industry. I don't really participate uh, um, 
with the with the professional association uh, maybe i don't have anything to add maybe i can't help this person and i think what kristen said about how you're just building a relationship with people it's okay just to ask them about their journey because that's something they can tell you right they might not know a lot about all that external stuff and they might not know about the industry so much or even pay that much attention to the recruitment process in their company but they can always tell you how they got where they are and what were steps that worked for them and what steps, you know, one of maybe some of even the missteps they'll share with you. And you're just connecting and making that relationship. Um, yeah, just to build on that, I think that uh, you know, how do you how do you find these people? And Kristen again said about the LinkedIn, finding people through LinkedIn. We talked about job with job uh, fairs and all those other ways to do it. Um, and so really professional associations would also be a really good um, way to find people as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. And then I think that um, yeah, I just and so the other thing was like the hiring. So thinking about questions that you were going to ask is um, you want to ultimately find out about the hiring process in your industry, but you also um, want to. So that whole idea of people not knowing whether they could have something to offer, I think that my my tip that I always give people is when you do an information interview try and make sure that that person walks away feeling like they did a good deed for the day and not being discouraged. Like, oh, I wasn't able to help that person. I, I don't know the hire. I don't know how the hiring process. I don't know anyone that, you know, that I don't, can't give them a job. I'm not in a position to hire people. So you really don't want people to walk away feeling like um, discouraged. You really want to pick people strategically that can help you, that can, strategically in like Kristen said do your research so you know what that person can give you you know what that person can share with you you know um you know you're not going to know the information but you know what that you want from them what like doing that research and knowing what you want for people so that when they walk away from that um, information interview you know they feel like they they did a good deed and that they helped you so um, another thing about the information interview, I mean, we could talk about this because, we, like I said, we do a two-hour program on, on this, but just as an example, you know, I hear all kinds of stories about, oh, I was at this community barbecue and I was talking to, just talking to people and ask, they were asking me, you know, what I was doing and, and people were, in, you know, people are interested because so many people here come from somewhere else. So where did you come from? What was your experience before? And they were talking and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm new, relatively new, and I don't have a job right now. And that can be difficult for people to talk about not having a job right now. And so they could say, they would say things like, you know, but I'm doing this volunteer work. And there's this one company I've researched, and I really, really want to work for them because of the projects they do. And they said, Oh, my cousin's actually an accountant for that company right so this person was an engineer and they're like but my cousin's an accountant he's not an engineer but he's an accountant Do you, maybe I can get him to connect with you and then so he that person they were able to arrange an information interview with the accountant at that company and you're thinking well I don't know any you know why would I talk to an accountant I'm an engineer but you know what just to get make that connection find out about the company ask questions about that project you're interested in they probably don't know about that kind of stuff but they'll know about the company they'll know about the kind maybe about the hiring process they'll know some of the people and then the, after that information interview the person said okay I'll take your, I'll ask, um, maybe I can ask an engineer if they'll do an information interview with you, make the, help you make that connection. And so they did that and helped make that connection. And then after that, it was, um, so that I got, that person got an information interview with an engineer from that firm then, and, you know, more talked, you know, more specifics about the company and about the projects and about why that person's interested and learn about that project and learn what else is happening with the organization. And then that person said, you know, took his resume and said, oh, I'm going to take it to my team and I'll, you know, take it to HR. And, and, it, and 
you know, long story short, or maybe not so short, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, you know, that person got hired not as an engineer, but as a lot as an engineer technician. And then once they were in the company, they got to work as um, eventually they, you know, within six months, they were working as an engineer as funding and projects came up that they needed somebody for, but then they were already working there and they could just move you into that position. So this is kind of like the process and it doesn't have to be as, as like um, Kristen said, it doesn't have to be as specific and as strategic to start, but um, I would mix it, you know, with your informal, uh, informal connections for networking, which is everybody, your family, your friends, your colleagues, um, your past colleagues, if you're a newcomer, maybe they know someone even if who's in Canada, but also, uh, yeah, do that research like Kristen said and then be, be very specific. But that is exactly how it happens. Do either of you have any tips uh, specifically on how to approach people to, to make the request or how to follow up with them afterwards to say thank you? Or is it just common sense? Strategies. Do you have any strategies, Kristen? Or Kristen? Um, I would say, in terms of uh, making those initial connections, um, I think it's. I think sometimes those um, connections will just naturally happen, especially if you're doing something like if there's a professional association that you were part of and kind of like a meeting or whatever, you know, there, there's like a natural kind of, you know, connection afterwards, you know, after the meeting or something, you can always be like, oh, hey, you know, I, I, you know, it was nice seeing you in the meeting. Do you mind if I ask you a couple questions? Like that, so um, that's one way to do it. Um, another way would be um, sometimes just reaching out to people on uh, LinkedIn, um, maybe making a comment about, um, you know, something that they posted um, or just kind of saying, hey, you know, I noticed, you know, uh, that, you know, I really like this project that you're involved in or, or, or something, um, you know, commenting on, on their LinkedIn or sending them a message, you know, or, or post or something um, like that can also be um, something that's really effective um, to uh, ways to, yeah, just ways to just kind of make those connections. I think just finding something in common um, that you have with them um, to start off is generally a good, uh, good, good place to start. That's and great. You, so I have lots oh. to talk about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could talk about this all day. And 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 um, Kelty knows that I can talk a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, since um, so she'll let me know if I talk too much. But yeah, I just have a lot of like uh, Kristen said again. The professional association is really good. Wherever you make those content. Um, wherever you make those connections is fantastic professional associations are great I like what Kristen said about the follow-up you know following up with people that you meet at those professional associations and connecting with them and then you know you meet someone and this can go for job fairs this can go for all kinds of places where you're going to meet people um so I think I think that's like kind of the important part is just, you know, being willing to just put yourself out there, right? Put yourself out there, go to some of these meetings um, with professional associations, go to job fairs, um, make sure your presence um, online and, and try and connect with people online as well. Like, I think that's like the key is just if you put yourself out there, then you'll eventually meet people and you can kind of engage in conversation with them from there. Yeah, thank you so much, you. both of you. I'll move on to the next question. Um, so transferable skills are another important part of marketing yourself to employers. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what transferable skills are and how a job seeker can capitalize on them to boost their employability. Uh, sure. So transferable skills are um, basically, uh, how I would describe it is just that action words. Um, so think of all of the action things um, that you did in previous employments. So things like you um, you prepared documents, you documented, you uh, created, um, you know, spreadsheets, you created, 
you know, uh, content for a website, whatever it may be. So just those kind of action words, the things that you did in your um, previous position, those are skills that can be uh, transferable, right? So things like, you know, preparing or creating or documenting or, you know, facilitating um, those kinds of skills are the skills that, you know, uh, you can take those skills because whether you are, you know, documenting, um, you know, in a chart or a graph, that's a skill that you can use to be, you know, you're documenting, um, you know, uh, and doing data entry, right, and doing the document documentation and things like that. So those kinds of skills are what we call transferable skills um, that you can take with you. Uh, from job to job, and as you uh, move uh, throughout your career, you gain more of those transferable skills uh, as you go. So that's kind of how I would describe it, I guess, is all the actions that you, you've done. Yeah, and I always give an example of that, you know, um, when, <laughs> when I give workshops, I, I, um, I feel like Sometimes people don't give themselves credit for all that they've done in their other jobs. I know that it's really, really hard to think about your transferable skills. It's really, really hard um, to sell yourself, to boast about what you've done or to even recognize. We take so much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as we take it for granted. So I always tell like people who stayed at home, maybe with their families for a time when their kids were preschoolers or you know other commitments that they had to their family even you know to aging parents maybe or, or to whatever family obligations you have um, you have to think about all those skills that you do so I always say if you look after your home you have you're a CEO right you have CEO experience because you you know if, especially if you, you know negotiating budgets for the household um, getting groceries in the house and other needs for the home is um, is supply chain management <laughs> you you've uh, looked after either you know um, maybe your sandwich between, you know, multiple families. It doesn't matter, just not just kids, you know, other family members, you do conflict resolution, you do communication, so you do, um, you know, you do, you do um, chauffeur, driving, transportation, logistics, <laughs> transfer, transportation, logistics. So there's so many things that you do just like you know, from one extreme, I know people always think, okay, they're thinking about their jobs, but not everyone, maybe people have been out of the workforce for a while, as well as a good time to use your transferable skills, your organization's skills, um, you know, to, and your time management skills, your, you know, for, for organizing activities and getting people where they need to be, when they need to be there, and um, all those kinds of, <laughs> all those kinds of things you do, budgets, I always think that's a really important uh, example of, you know, beyond even your workplace, but it does make you think, okay, that's my home and that's what I've done and I do all these things and then that helps you take it one step further. After you think about all those things you do at home, taking it into the workplace and thinking about it at, in those terms about what you've done in your past work experiences can really help you come up with those uh, trigger words as well. Do you know maybe like maybe like the five top transferable skills that employers are looking for, or just to either of you, <laughs> or does it vary too much? Give a couple. Maybe we can each give a couple because I don't know if we can go with five. But I'll you go first. I'll, I'll let you go first. I'll now try and fill in a few. Um, I feel like. I, I haven't really researched, so I don't really know what they are, but um, I feel like it would um, usually um, a lot of times people are looking for kind of the uh, like more human skills kind of. So like um, communication, teamwork, um, you know, that kind of interpersonal um, skills is usually something that um, I, f I feel would be pretty high um, on the mm -hmm. list. 
I would agree. Teamwork is huge for sure. I mean, in Canadian workplace culture, it's all about um, it's all about collaboration and teamwork. And it's funny because sometimes, you know, people, they hire for teamwork, even though you never talk to another person all day in the job that they hire you for. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes yeah. that can be you know maybe they don't get the right person if they're not honest about that but teamwork mm -hmm. teamwork is is everything in collaboration I feel like in workplace mm -hmm. communication emotion. as well good communication, communication skills and yeah the other thing I would say is customer service it's it's mm -hmm. surprising how many companies um ask for customer service even though you're thinking but I'm not I'm not in sales I don't have any customers but the funny thing is at, li at the library, of course, um, the people who come, the patrons are my, are the customers and WorkBC has, you know, their clients who are customers. Um, but even in a company that doesn't serve the public the way WorkBC in the library does, your colleagues are your customers. Um, you, you, your clients, even if you're not in direct contact with them, you still have to work with the end user in mind. And and I think that customer service comes up time and time again. So people don't, but people don't think of it in that terms. Um, I think that, yeah, so that would be definitely another one that's really important. You know, very good sure. And, and just like you said, there's this whole book, you know, about likability, this likability mm -hmm. uh, factor. And I think that um, like this, we have a book at the library, it always hits me, uh, you know, that likability. And, and it's true. So that comes with communication, that, but it comes also and comes with the teamwork and collaboration. But it also, you know, it comes with different workplace cultures. We talk about that. Um, like I said, we have at the at VPL, we have a workshop on uh, workplace culture and communications and trying to, you know, figure that out. But I think that... Um, you want it, that's why you want to do the information interviews again, <laughs> you know, with not uh -huh. hitting that on the head all the time over and over again, but it allows you to learn what the workplace culture is and learn whether that's an environment that you want to work in, because there's not a right or a wrong. Of course, there's a wrong and we have employment standards that look after mm -hmm. that, but <laughs> having, let's put that aside, but having that workplace culture and learning about that, because if you work in, if you're really extroverted and you're going to work in this culture, workplace culture that people kind of keep in themselves, that, and that's nothing wrong with that. People just get their head down and come in and get their work done and go home. That's fine. That's great. That's the workplace culture of that company. But if you're not, you know, you're more extroverted and you want more relationship and with your colleagues, then you want to look at other workplace. You want to, you know, a workplace that's a little bit more um, involvement and allows you opportunity to socialize in or collaborate and things like that. So I think that would be like those soft skills. Think about what your preferences are. It's not just what the company is. Think mm -hmm. about your preferences and and uh, and where you're going to be happiest and fit in. Thank and you so I much. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, you've both brought up the importance of networking for employment quite a bit, um, but a lot of newcomers who arrive in Canada face the challenge of having to build up that professional network from the ground up. Uh, so what are some networking opportunities that are available for newcomers, um, particularly in a time that's still a bit focused on social distancing? Um, I would say, again, like the important, the best way to do that is to just put yourself out there. Go to as many um, different events and different workshops and different services um, as you can. There are, um, you know, uh, there's even just going to the library or coming to a work BC center, um, there is the opportunity to just, you know, network with the staff um, that you uh, come across. You can talk to the staff have um, oftentimes if, you know, they're, they're not able to uh, share their own stories, uh, they're able to have connections with, uh, with other employers, with other uh, colleagues, um, and you know that that's a really great way to do that. Um, their uh, job fairs are another really great way um, to make connections. There's uh, lots of uh, virtual ones 
Um, there's also uh, in-person ones are starting to come back as well. Um, so um, yeah, just really putting yourself out there. Volunteering again is another great way um, to do that. Um, and uh, some of the services that uh, we offer at uh, WorkBC are, um, you know, we, we do have uh, job developers that can connect you um, as well to different employers. Um, so there's lots and lots of different ways uh, to uh, make those connections to uh, start networking, but you really gotta just be open to just putting yourself out there. Um, even if it is just on social media, um, you know, putting yourself out there on, on online, having an online presence and connecting with um, other employers or even just other people interested in the same industry um, that you are, right? Um, just, yeah, that I, I can't stress that enough is the importance of just being willing to just put yourself out there um, and, and make those connections. Yeah, so There's yeah, I agree with everything that Chris <laughs> said. There's um, that pretty much sums it up. But you know, there, so I guess what I can add to that is that the um, one of my colleagues did this program in the past that was called Networking with Curiosity. So really, was about being curious. And, you know, um, and of course, that's easier for extroverts than it is for introverts to go out there. You know. You know, obviously I talk a lot and I talk to everybody and I'm like, you know, I'll talk to people on the bus until they get up and move. And <laughs> so, but being curious about others and, and, and for, for no, um, you know, for no output, right? Like for no, not without, like people think, oh, I don't want to go ask people or I don't, I don't, there's nobody in that group that can do something for me, right? There's no one there who can do something for me. But it's okay because one, you don't know that for sure. But um, but just being curious about others and engaging with others, and also it's not networking. And networking isn't just about what people can do for you. It's also about what you can do for them because it makes you feel filled up inside and you feeling like part of the community. And it gives you all this engagement with the community. And that's the same with uh, volunteering, even if it's not professional. It's not give you know. Um, you think of it in terms of having fun, you, but you're also contributing and giving back to the community. And I think we've said this before in, in Canada, it is, especially BC, it work, volunteer work does count as work experience. So you do put it on your resume and people in interviews may ask you about that. So um, getting off topic, but just so you know that that's there, how do the question is um, when people arrive, how do they can engage with the professional network? So it is that curiosity it's connecting with others. It's doing things, finding opportunities to do things for other people, as well as finding opportunities for people to do things for you. Because I really, um, I see that um uh, one it gives you some, it makes you feel good but two if you do a favor for someone and you're able to give them information or direct them you know then they're like oh yeah that person helped me out and and then next time they have a reason they they will and sometimes it's not that person off sometimes you help people and they're not in a position to help you back but it's like what we call pay it forward somebody else will help you right so it always like just you know, being out there, being open, being curious, helping, getting help from others, getting help from you. And you can do that. Like there's meetup groups. So meetup.com can be and other social media groups, but meetup.com, if you go there and slash Vancouver, you, there are professional meetups, there's career and business meetups. And then there's meetups by, by um, subject like tech meetups, if you're in the technology sector, remember too that technology sector is one of the fastest growing industries in BC. And we do at the Vancouver Public Library Skilled Immigrant Info Center have, you know, all these fastest growing industry guides. So you can research an industry that interests you, everything from agri-foods and biotech and, and healthcare and construction and sports and entertainment. So, you know, you can look and see where you fit in best, but just remember, you can pick an industry that you like. So if you're doing a support job like um, human resources or bookkeeping or finance or payroll or customer service or sales or reception or 
um, or any of those uh, kind of support roles, administrative assistant, all companies hire those people, all industries hire those people. So pick an industry that's growing, pick an industry that you like. So you could go to a tech company, even if you're a tech meetup, even if you're not a techie and find out about opportunities and companies and find out what, who's hiring. And they will at those tech meetups, in my experience of going to them and talk about that. People will talk about what their company is looking for. You can learn about the company, you can meet people in the company, you can ask for information interviews. So that's one of the ones that I think we haven't mentioned before is these meetup groups. And so that is a strategy. So but also there's lots of fun things to do on, on, on Meetup as well. Maybe you're hiking, maybe you're into board games. Even during the pandemic, they had virtual board games. And so they have, or if you're in knitting or putting model airplanes together, people did that, met on Zoom and did that together and talked about that. And the minute you walk into virtually or in person, walk into one of those meetup uh, meetings, you automatically have something in common with every single person in that room. And um, even if it's a Zoom room and, and when you have something in common with people, they want to share with you. Okay, so what else yeah. I was something else? Would you guys say that LinkedIn is probably one of the main sort of online networking opportunities yeah, for people? That's your professional networking. That's your yeah. professional networking um, platform. So something like I don't know, six hundred million people are on on uh, LinkedIn for on LinkedIn have profiles on LinkedIn uh, worldwide about. Um, 300 million of those people are active monthly. So it's a really good place to go. Um, LinkedIn can be a really good place to uh, um, find people. So you can just do a search graphic designers, right? In Vancouver or something like that. And that can, you, you can use um, to find people or, you know, software companies, or if there's a company you see on um, a directory. So the library has all these directories where you can get a whole list of the fastest growing companies in BC, the, the, the biggest um, tech companies in BC, the biggest architect companies, the biggest public relation companies, the biggest tourist companies. So it goes on and on. So you could get your list of the biggest companies and, and use that and then look at them um, on LinkedIn, look at their website, you know, do your research. But LinkedIn, you can connect with people that way so that's just a cold call kind of connection on how you can uh, meet people on linkedin but there's also i think kristen said this already before is finding people on linkedin like following up with people so linkedin is an amazing tool to follow up with people that you met maybe you met somebody hiking on a meetup and then you you want to follow up with them and connect with them or maybe you met someone at a job fair uh, or maybe a workshop that you were at at bpl or, or work bc and you're going to follow up. So LinkedIn can be an amazing tool. And again, WorkBC said that they have courses that help you build your profile and tips and tricks. And VPL also has, um, oh, once a month, we have a two hour workshop and we help people build out their resume, uh, build up their LinkedIn account. And then we help them with, again, how to follow through, how to connect with people, how to, um, how to, uh, not just make it not just push that connect button you know like it's not like Facebook where you just hit that friend button you actually hit the connect button and then you if you and go to their profile and it gives you an opportunity to um it gives you an opportunity to write a note why you want to connect with them so that's mm -hmm. what maybe you met them at a job fair like um, Kristen said, or maybe you met them at a professional association, and you can make a note to remind them that you met there. Um, one of the questions in the chat reminded me of another, um, uh, where else do I meet people? And um, where was it? They asked me about internships and mentorships. So there are programs for internships and mentorships. I think WorkBC can connect you with that as well. But um, I, but, and Mosaic and there's all these other places where you can get internships and mentorships. Sometimes there are eligibility requirements for that. So a lot of um, mentorships for permanent resident status, um, fewer maybe for uh, work, work visas and, and that those different statuses required. Um, different programs require different 
uh, statuses across the board. So that's just so much to get into, but uh, there are some really good mentorship programs through um, Immigrant, Immigrant Employment Council of BC is, is a good organization to connect with. And um, they actually have a program with the city of Vancouver that uh, they do uh, mentorships and some librarians uh, as, as BPL members, we um, can be a part of that program as well. But there's, so those are all things to ask about and check out at work BC and at the library. Uh, what else did I have? Sure. Some, just kind of made some, Another, any other connections? Um, like, because job fairs have already been mentioned and I said that before. You go ahead, Kristen, if you have something else. Oh, yeah. Um, I was also going to say, um, as a new immigrant, just connecting with um, some of the different immigrant services um, organizations that are around, such as um, like ISS of BC, uh, Mosaic, Success, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, and just going and connecting with them, uh, because not only is it a good um, opportunity to meet people, they um, also are very knowledgeable about all the different resources available to, to um, immigrants and um, also, sometimes a lot of them have um, like ESL groups uh, where you can just meet up um, with um, others and just practice your English as well um, and uh, things like that. So I, I would, uh, you know, and it's also a place where um, I feel people can share their stories about, you know, oh, I've been looking for work and like, here's how, you know, here's how I, you know, places that I've been connected to here's you know and it's a good place to network just with um with others who are kind of in the same situation as you right and so I highly recommend um checking uh, some of those different organizations out for sure thank you that's very good advice um I'll go to the next question. Um, newcomers often come to Canada with a considerable amount of training and education uh, from their home countries uh, so what does transferring your credentials look like in British Columbia? And do you have any advice? Wow. <laughs> it's, a <laughs> question. Question. it's a big question. It's a big question. So I just want to make sure that people know that the difference between a regulated profession and an unregulated profession. So that's a good place to start to look at that. And again, like I was saying, the BPL, Skilled Immigrant Info Center, we actually have created... Um, about more than 170 guides about about careers, specific careers. So if I everything from if I want to be an accountant in BC, what do I need to know? If I want to be a baker, if I want to be you know an ECE, if I want to be information systems analyst, everything from an A to welder, and you know a vet tech, you know if I want to do this job in BC, what do I need to know? And we do put in each and every one of those guides, and we have them on level four at VPL at 350 West Georgia, and where you can just pick them up, their photocopies and take them. But they're also all online on the Skilled Immigrant Info Center website. And we put in each and every one of those guides, whether that profession is regulated and, or unregulated. So you kind of know, and we put the professional association for each profession as well. So you know where to go to do all that networking that Kristen and I have been talking about. And, um, and also, um, we have in the job search and career resources guides that we made up and that's everywhere. Uh, guides from, you know, avoiding employment scams to, um, and to uh, transferable skills and getting Canadian experience and um, writing your resumes and um, Use it, networking for employment and using uh, your social media for networking for employment and all those. We also have one um, for regulated, non explaining regulated, non regulated professions. So, and I think my colleague Kelsey is putting these links in the, in the chat too. So, just to be helpful. And so, it's really important to know whether your profession is regulated and non regulated because. If it's a regulated profession, you really need to go specifically to the regulatory body who looks after that profession. So if you're a teacher, you need to go to that organization to, and only they can evaluate your credentials and decide whether you need to, um, whether you can do that job in Canada or not. 
Okay, I'm, I'm gonna come back to that though. And also like an engineer, you would go to EGBC, Engineers and Geoscientists of BC, um, you know, um, an accountant, you'd go to CPA. So there's all these regulated professions and only those organizations can evaluate your credentials and your post past education, skills and experience and decide whether you can do that job in BC or not. So having said that, I wanna make sure that you know, I honestly believe that the answer is not, yes, you can do this job and no, you cannot do this job, right? It is a process. They will tell you, they'll evaluate your credentials, they'll see what you brought with you and they'll say, okay, great. So this is what you need to do to, be, to do that job here. So it's a process. So it's not yes or no, it's a process. And then you have to do your research and, and decide, is this a process I'm willing to do or not? So for example, obviously if you're going to be an accountant in BC or in Canada, we have different tax laws and different, um, you know, there'll, there'll be things that are different. So they may say, okay, you need to take this course or that course, right? If you want to be a construction manager or architect, we have different building codes in, in Canada, right? So our, for our, because our weather is different maybe than where you, you live. So of course the buildings are going to have different regulations and maybe, and so you they're going to want you to do certain courses to um, make your credentials match. Your credentials were perfect, probably, and, and probably, you know, extremely uh, wonderful from where you are. There's just gonna be these tweaks that you have to do. And um, I can tell you that happens even across um, Canada. My niece, she's a, she went to Queens in Ontario. She did her teacher's college in Ontario. Her husband's an engineer. He got a job in Alberta. So she went to Alberta to teach. They gave her two years. They wouldn't automatically recognize her teaching certificate right away in Alberta from Ontario even. And they gave her two years to take these two undergraduate math courses because they don't let their teachers have their teaching certificate without these undergraduate math courses, for example, right? So she had two years to take those undergraduate math courses to make, to update her, um, to have her credentials and her teaching certificate recognized in Alberta. I want you to know that she was not teaching math. She is not teaching math. She never will teach math. She's teaching social sciences and arts. But that's one of the requirements for teaching in Alberta, which is different than Ontario. So this, there's going to be these little tweaks. And then you can make them, you can explore all that and decide, make informed decisions, whether this is what you're going to go through this process or not. And then, but, and you can also explore alternative careers. So we do have a whole package of guides for these regulated professions and what kind of alternative careers are available with your skills, education, experience for your consideration. And sometimes these alternative careers you can transfer in right away. And sometimes they just have short, um, short little courses that you can uh, do to, um, it won't be doing your profession, but it'll be related to your career and you can do that in the interim while you're waiting for your credentials to be evaluated and, and, and while you're waiting to do courses to upgrade back into your profession. Or you can maybe just do an alternative career. So um, sometimes like a pharmacist, internationally trained pharmacist will go into pharmaceutical sales or something like that. So just that, that's all available for your consideration. And um, okay, that was a good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> Kristen, did you want to add anything maybe about like what types of supports are available to people who are trying to navigate this process? Um, yeah, so I was just going to add that um, depending um, on your situation and uh, whatnot, there are um, opportunities uh, for WorkBC, for example, can cover some of the costs. Um, associated with upgrading um, if, if that's needed. Um, it, it kind of varies on individual circumstance, but um, I, I would highly encourage, you know, if, if they come back and they say, oh, well, you know, we'll give you, uh, as Heidi was mentioning, um, you know, in order to secure your teacher license, you need to do these two courses. There's um, possibilities um, that exist to uh, have funding for that. So um, don't uh, you know, because I think a lot of times people are overwhelmed. They've just come to a new country and now they're like, oh, now I have to pay to go back to school, right? Um, 
So um, there is different uh, services and things available for people doing that. Um, and um, I think um, also another thing um, to, uh, Heidi, I think touched a little bit on this earlier um, in terms of like, even if you do have all of your credentials and they're all equivalent and you can, you know, it, it sometimes doesn't necessarily automatically mean that you can go and get that engineering job right away, right? Um, sometimes it does, uh, you know, you may need to go and take a job as like an engineering assistant maybe just to get your foot in the door. Um, so just, um, I want to put that out there that even if your credentials are recognized and verified, it's not always necessarily going to guarantee that you will now, um, you know, be guaranteed to find work with with that certification, right? So, mm -hmm. um, just something to keep in the back of your mind that um, you know you may need to uh, you know, build up um, that Canadian experience. Thank you. That leads me into the, ne the, the next and final question. Um, so while working to break into their own field of employment, uh, some newcomer job seekers run into the issue of being seen as overqualified for their first roles in Canada. Could you guys speak to this a little bit? Um, yeah, I can. It, it is unfortunate, um, but a lot of times uh, companies want to hire people who have Canadian experience, um, who have Canadian uh, references that they can um, call and, and, and it. Um, so sometimes uh, people do need to start out at a job that may not be at the same level that they would prefer to. Um, but um, it's just really important, I would say, to just get your foot in the door. Um, if you want to uh, work in tech industry, for example, just get a job doing something, you know, data entry or something in a tech firm. Um, because what that allows you to do, it allows you to, you know, get some of that Canadian experience, get those references. It also allows for um, the company that you're working for, um, it's a chance for you to show them uh, your skills and your abilities. And when there is a position, a higher up position that opens up, like you're already there, you're already in the company and they tend, most companies tend to promote from within um, the company. So, um, you know, if, if there's, if it's really about just getting your foot in the door in a Canadian company, working um, and getting those references. Um, and yeah, as I was mentioning earlier, like sometimes it's not, you know, you're not necessarily able to do that um, at the level which you might like, um, but it, it, there is a process um, and sometimes it's just, you know, making that sacrifice to take the, the lesser job for a little bit of time um, just to get your foot in the door. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend that people just, you know, again, put yourself out there and just get in somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's also easier, it's also easier to find another job when you are employed versus being unemployed. So that's another advantage as well as just, you, you don't, you know, when you get a job at, at a particular company, it doesn't mean that, you know, you have to stay there or, and you have to grow up in that company. It, you can also be looking for work um, while you're currently working. Um, and that in and of itself, the fact that you just have a job and are currently employed is gonna definitely boost uh, your employability with other companies as well. So. Yeah, that, that is an amazing point. So that just basically sums up working <laughs> into the uh, Vancouver job market is just get a job, right? And then yeah. and take it from there. So I totally agree with that. I think there's, you know, the thing is that promoting from within is one thing and, and, and also, um, you know, too, sometimes they'll bring you in as an architect technician or as an engineer technician or, you know, at that lower level. And then they, that, then you're used to, but they're test driving, like you test drive a car or whatever, right? And contract work is very common in BC. I think that's something we haven't touched on at all is that 
there are these three month contracts and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And they often get extended and they lead into full-time work. So I've had that question before. Oh, people, I've been offered this three month contract. Like I just want a permanent full-time job. And sometimes that is your way into a permanent full-time job. And we haven't talked about that as a, as a possibility to get into the Vancouver job market yet. And it works the same as all the thing for all the same reasons that Kristen just said. So um, I think that's a really good opportunity to get promoted from within. And, and also like you said about getting, um, it's easier to get a job when you're working. One is because you're, you're building a network with colleagues and maybe the company's customers and other companies who do what you do, or, you know, like, you know, the company's competitors or company's clients and all those, you're making connections all over the place. And you could be asking questions and networking with those other companies in, where people were more open to maybe answer those questions. And because you're not job searching from them, right? You're, they don't think of you as job searching. They think of you, it's a not great opportunity to be curious about other companies and about organizations and, and people aren't going to, are going to answer those questions based on your interest and your curiosity and your engagement rather than coming at it from, oh, that person's job hunting and I can't give them a job and I don't know, you know? <laughs> so I think that's, I think that's um, really helpful in what Kristen um, said about, um, said about references. It's so, you know, local references are really, really important and, um, and people just aren't going to call another company, another language, another time zone, you know, um, to get a reference, right? They're not going to phone long distance, another country, another language to get a reference for you. They want local references. And so, uh, that, that's all part of getting Canadian experience, even, yeah. Do either of you have any specific tips on how to sort of adapt your resume if you are overqualified for a job that you're applying to? Do you have any tips for that? Um, I would say the one thing um, that I would say is that you, you don't need to put everything that you've ever done on your resume, right? Um, you don't have to, um, you know, if you have a, a, a PhD, uh, for example, you don't necessarily need to include that on your resume, right? Um, that is something that, you know, maybe you can bring up later or, or something like that. But it's, um, you know, and just also being um, strategic about uh, maybe a uh, language that you use um, in your cover letter or, or in your resume as well. Um, you know, just you know, mentioning what you did, but maybe not going into quite as much detail or maybe um, trying to write it down in simpler terms. Um, things like that can be very helpful um, to kind of, you know, make it appear that you're not um, overqualified because unfortunately that is sometimes reality uh, that then when you are job searching if they feel that you're overqualified for the position they won't necessarily um, you know uh, follow up with you so um, it's yeah there, there's lots of tips um, you know at, at work VC uh, we have uh, facilitators here who can help you uh, work on your resume and, and show you how to do that um, but yeah I think the biggest thing is you don't necessarily have to include everything that you've done on your resume um, I know in some places it's important to list all of your careers and everything like that but in Canada it's not necessary um, to have it all on there yeah I, I know that and I know that that's a, a comes up a lot with newcomers and, and it is frustrating because people have spent a lot of time and money and energy and, and they should take pride in what they've accomplished in life. So I can understand why people are worried about that. But it can be, um, from the employer's point of view, it is like um, maybe they're hiring a an engineer, but maybe they are the engine position is a junior position. And if you have that resume that has all that on it, they're going to say, 
you know, well, that person is applying for this job, but they think it has more responsibility than it does. And so they're not going to be happy here. Or they, they're going to think, well, that person isn't, you know, thinks that this is a, they're going to have more say or more, um, they're not going to be challenged. They're not going to have the same opportunity for input and they're going to be dissatisfied. So they want to hire somebody who will, um, you know, fit that position better or also the salary that might not pay as much mm -hmm. as they're worried about that you're not going to be willing or, or, you know, it's not going to be acceptable for you to work for that, um, for that pay. And so they're from a, it's not against you so much. It's also the employer trying to figure out uh, what they can, um, what's the best fit for that position because they know that position and they don't want you to come in and be happy or dissatisfied or um, so as well. But again, of course, um, if you can convey all that information to an employer and give them the opportunity to let you grow with that company and promote from within that is, I think, important. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. We're at 1140 and I just want to make sure we get a chance to answer everyone's questions. Uh, so thank you so much for, for all your words of wisdom. Um, and I will go ahead and start with the first question. Oh, my computer is glitching. Um, so are uh, these services, this was asked early on, so it might've been to do with WorkBC or SIC, are they available for older uh, mid-senior immigrant professionals? Most programs seem to be available for people under 30 years old. Um, we at WorkBC can help anybody of all ages. Uh, there's, um, we don't have um, age restrictions on our services here at WorkBC. Um, I, so I, I'm not, uh, it, I, I will say that it is definitely more challenging for older workers to uh, find employment for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that older workers do tend to uh, bring with them a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of experience and stuff, which can be very valuable. Um, for sure. Uh, one of the services that we offer at uh, WorkBC is uh, we have job development, uh, job development team and what they do is they can help, uh, they can take your resume and they can help market you um, specifically to, to specific employers. Um, so, uh, you know, and at least, you know, help you get an interview. Um, at least. So there is uh, services, definitely services out there for older workers. Um, and again, um, with regards to older workers and applying for work, um, I think it's important to um, you know be careful as well about what you put on your resume. Um, so you know maybe um, you know don't put the year next to your degree when you got it, right? Because there's sometimes there's telltale signs. If you know, you see this person, oh, they earned their, their master's in 1980. Well, you, you know how old they are, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, just little tricks like that of like maybe not putting the date on it and, um, you know, maybe not listing your work history so far back, um, you know, or, or, or things like that can also be, um, tips to help you um, at least get you an interview um, for sure. So, but Thank yeah, you. there are services out there for, for older workers. Yeah, I've put a few in the chat. Um, and Heidi, did you have any, obviously at the library, we, we take everybody uh, regardless of age. So, right. so um, everyone's welcome, of course, at the library. We even, again, in the Skilled Immigrant Info Center, we created a guide looking for work as an older worker, I mean, um, I think, again, it's been touched on that the richness of a mature worker and their older experiences can be um, an asset to an organization. So you just need to find the right organization mm -hmm. to value that and appreciate it. The only time I've seen restrictions by age is sometimes when there's government funded 
um, training opportunities and training programs. Then sometimes it's a youth program from 18 to 29 or something like that. But um, I, I think pretty much everything is, I, I haven't seen, I haven't, it's been, not been my experience that um, programs and things are limited by age. The library has lots of programs, everyone's welcome. Doesn't matter if you're in immigration status, doesn't matter your age, everybody's welcome. The resources. Yes. Um, another question we have is, can we put uh, transferable skills that we do at home into our resume? Maybe that one's for you, Heidi, since you were talking about the stay-at-home mom example. Hi, and again, I think it's just what we heard already from WorkBC is that it's all about, you know, getting help with your resume and how you frame it and, and the words that you use. And, mm -hmm. and I definitely think that the work that people do at home, the logistics, I know that I feel like I could do, you know, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of skills and organization skills, time management skills, um, logistics skills based on my home experience. I really think that, um, like, like, we've heard before, I think really getting help on your resume and there's lots of experts, right? There's lots of organizations out there who help work BC would be my first stop. And then depending on, you know, your um, status and your eligibility for different programs, seek it out, get lots of advice. I mean, we'll give you the resources that can help you with that, but, um, yeah, we can give you the resources to help you with that. We try not to give advice, although, of course. Right. Yeah, and, a, and a lot of that stuff is um, also uh, we offer uh, interview skills uh, workshops as well, because um, a lot of times, um, you know, maybe you wouldn't necessarily put it on your resume, but it's definitely something that would come up uh, in an interview and just learning how to market yourself and how to talk about um, those skills that you gained um, in an interview is, is sometimes really, really important as well, right? And being able to, you know, when somebody questions you, oh, I see this gap in employment, you can say, well, yeah, I took time off to raise my family, but I've learned this and this, and here's all the skills that I have from doing that, right? So uh, mm -hmm. it's also uh, about how you market yourself in an interview as well. For sure. Uh, this is a great question we've got next, and it touches upon some stuff from the chat as well. Uh, it says, hi, thanks for some motivating words, but I'm facing a challenge here with job opportunities because I have an open work permit. Uh, most of the opportunities are either for PRs or Canadian citizens. Can you please guide me on how I can figure out programs supporting temporary workers? This is a tough one. There was another question, um, maybe you can answer right away, Kristen, was does WorkBC help open work permit holders? <laughs> Well, I know the answer. <laughs> uh, um, you do. Um, so in, it's kind of a little bit complicated. So um, at WorkBC, there are um, some services which you, you do need to be a PR uh, and, and have a work permit and stuff to participate in. Um, however, um, at uh, work VC, we have a resource room that is always open um, to anybody. And if you are always welcome to come in and we have facilitators who can, um, you know, uh, help you with your resume and cover letters and stuff like that. Um, so it, it, some services may be limited, unfortunately. Um, but uh, again, what I would recommend is uh, also making sure uh, that you connect with uh, different immigrant uh, services. Um, so like again, ISS of BC, uh, Mosaic, uh, Success, um, organizations like that, they have much more um, experience um, with uh, you know Im immigrants and they know a lot, they have a lot of resources that can, um, that uh, are, are specifically uh, geared towards immigrants and towards uh, people who do not have work visas and things like that. So um, I would highly, uh, usually that is where I would send uh, clients who don't qualify for services at work VC is to uh, one of the immigrant, uh, immigrant services uh, organizations. 
they're much more knowledgeable. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, in particular, there's one uh, success runs. It's BC, BCSIS, BC Services and Integration Services. I don't know if I got the acronym right. Um, I'll just put that in the chat. Um, particularly for people who are here on work visa or international students, this is the sort of the place you want to go to first, um, because that's sort of their directive is to help people who aren't PRs, who aren't mm -hmm. landed immigrants, right? Uh, Heidi, did you want to add to that? Well, success is one that we work with a lot, the BCSIS. So that what that BCSIS, we don't, I can't remember the, what the acronym stands for either. So I'm not going to be helpful, but it, it is funding from Welcome BC, which is the British Columbia government, which is different than PRs, which are usually funded by Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada, which is the federal government funding. And right. there are other organizations. I think Impact North Shore also has a contract with BCSIS and so if there's, there are other places to go. I mean, we work a lot with these other organizations at the library, of course, so I will let you know again. And everyone's welcome at the library. It does not matter what your status in Canada is. Everyone's welcome to our resources, our support and help. I, because we have multi-level funding, that's what it all comes down to, right? Uh -huh. And because we have that multi-level funding, that's why. We do have the Welcome BC funding. We do have IRCC funding. And of course, we also have funding as we're, uh, we're funded by the city of Vancouver. We're a public mm -hmm. library. We're funded to help everybody. Yes. So no, what, oh, oh, sorry, what, yeah. what I was also going to suggest is that if you are, uh, if you have applied for your PR and you're waiting um, to get it, um, I would highly recommend, again, uh, volunteering somewhere, taking the opportunity um, to volunteer. Um, and that way, when you do get your PR and you are able, and, or your work permit, and, and you are able to start working, you've already made um, those, those connections. You, you've been able to network, um, you know, and, and you already have a little bit of Canadian experience and, and references and stuff as well. So, um, it, I, I know it's not necessarily ideal, but um, yeah, take the opportunity um, if, if you're able to uh, while you're waiting for all of your, because sometimes it can take a while, I know, for documents to get approved. Mm -hmm. So another tip that I think it was someone from WorkBC that gave me before was um, once you've applied for your PR, put on your resume PR pending. Mm -hmm. oh, that good advice. People make. Uh, just a related question quickly for Kristen. Um, does WorkBC help with student internships or with paid internships? Again, mm, unfortunately, no. Um, that is not something. Um, if I would recommend that students um, check out, I know, I can't remember the name of it right now, but I know Douglas College um, can, has something that. Uh, help students with internships and stuff like that. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I'm really sorry. Um, uh, but um, yeah, unfortunately, that's not something um, that WorkBC uh, can help with. So we're, uh, we're both helping people find um, you know, permanent full-time employment. And so unfortunately, students don't really fall into that category because they're usually just looking for summer jobs. Um, another uh, one, we do have um, another good resource that I would check out. Um, we do have a dedicated um, work BC for uh, youth. It's called uh, Career Zone. It's on Granville. Uh, I can't remember exactly mm -hmm. where it is, but it's on Granville Street. I can look it up and put it in the chat. Um, and it's geared to, uh, it's specifically geared to youth. Um, and so they um, oftentimes uh, have, uh, you know, uh, leads on, uh, they can direct um, you to services that uh, can help with that kind of stuff. Thanks. And I just wanted to say I put in the chat um, a guide that we have on to help people who are looking for internships and mentorship opportunities. Um, so I will go to the next question. Um, do you have any tips on how to avoid scam job advertisements? And I'm also going to put a guide in the in the chat for you. But um, Kristen and Heidi, do you have any suggestions? 
Yeah, that, that it is a hard one, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that something like that exists because I know that there's lots of regulatory, like the government tries to not have that happen, but you know people find ways. Um, I usually, you know, the golden rule is if it's too good to be true, then it, it's uh, it's not probably true. But it, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you get in there. If if people, I can tell you one thing in that guide that it talks about is that is that um, if they ask you to pay money, so if they ask you to buy a product in order for you to have the job, um, or if they ask you to pay money, um, that's not legal. There's all kinds of things. You just start to get used to what's legal and what's not also. Volunteer work, um, we've talked about this many times, it's not doing your job for free. So if you're an internationally trained accountant, you don't go into a company and say, I'm going to be an accountant for you for three months for free to get Canadian experience. That's not what it is. It's not doing your job for free. So you should not be working for free. You should not be paying uh, for training. Usually a company will train you. There's a lot of red flags. You shouldn't be buying a product. Um, you know, those are not mm -hmm. uh, usually, those are usually red flags. But like I said, like Kelsey said, she put a guide that we have at BPL to help you with that. And you can always ask for help at the library to check it out, or I'm not sure if Fort BC can help with that or not, but. Um, I would also uh, say it would be a red flag if it's like, you know, they're willing to pay you in cash mm -hmm. um, is, is also kind of a red flag as well. Most companies won't, um, won't pay cash uh, for, you know, or like write you a check usually it's yeah yeah <laughs> so be wary <laughs> we have a guide too like what is this employment rules mm. like standard mm. employment mm. so if a company offers to pay you less and at the end of a year they'll you know you know put in for your work permit or something like just kind of things like that just mm. being careful thank you um now a, a couple of resume questions um so one is just a clarification on a point that I believe that you made, Heidi, is do you recommend putting our status in the resume, I am a PR? So I think you were just saying if your PR is pending, maybe put it in there, but I'll let you. Yeah, there's not really, the point is there's not really a section on where to put that on your resume. So I, so that's, you know, it's kind of like, where does that go? But that was kind of that question if, they, if people are asking them if they're, um, if people are asking them if they're a work permit and, and they feel like they're not getting consideration because it's true, if you only have a six month work permit, it can be hard to get a professional job, right? People, companies might, mm -hmm. you know, it, for one, it sometimes takes one or two months to hire people and then the process. So that can be hard, um, but just for that question if people have a work permit, but they've already submitted for their PR, then, you know, make that clear that, well, I do, I, my PR is pending, I have applied, but you know, usually status isn't, there isn't a place on resumes for status, and so I would definitely um, refer to Kristen on that, what she thinks, because we I, uh, uh, personally, unless it's stated in the job posting, mm -hmm. um, you know, must be PR or, or, or something, I personally wouldn't uh I wouldn't put it on um just because um you know there is a lot of unfortunately discrimination that happens and a lot of if, if you know if they see oh you're just PR then it kind of you know they're like oh well you know they're not going to be you know here for a long time and they're not going to you know or Oh, they're they're a recent immigrant, and 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 so it, it leaves open that door, right? Um, which I, I uh, unless I I personally I wouldn't put it on unless it was um, like it said in the job posting that you need to be PR. Um, and and usually, I, I only the it. government jobs ask for that, right? They have those requirements. Like a uh, yeah, some, some mostly government, most, most jobs don't even really ask, but yeah, so it, it's usually if you're applying for like some kind of government, um, position, but 
Yeah, I, I personally wouldn't mention it if if it doesn't ask for it. And that's from a career counselor. So take <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, I just want to, to add, uh, remember that you can go to Work BC Center to have your resume looked at uh, by a professional. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm also putting in um, the drop-in resume clinic that we do in partnership with Success BCSIS. Um, so yes, please use the resources that are available to you to get help if you have specific questions. There was a question in the chat about what to take out of a resume if you are looking for a survival job or if you are overqualified. So just, um, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, so I'm just going to do one second. I, I would just like to say, um, you know, if anybody has any questions, they're always welcome to uh, come to a work BC uh, Work BC office, and um, you know we can answer individual questions. Um, and it's a free service, so you can just come and ask. Thank you, and I will just put up my screen here. Um, can everyone see that? It's not much of a slideshow. Okay. You can see it. Perfect. So we may not have answered uh, all of your questions today. Uh, I just want to say that you can always, this is the wrong slide. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Everything there. Um, reach out to us, okay? So uh, you can reach out to us in person on level four of the Central Library. Uh, that's uh, SIC's website, vpl.ca slash SIC. Um, and for WorkBC, you can go to this shortened link here, WorkBC Centers, and you can... Uh, find out where your closest center is and, and visit, right? You can also call ahead and make sure that, uh, that you will be able to get the services that, uh, that you want, okay? So I just wanna thank everybody who joined today um, and special thanks to our panelists, Heidi and Kristen, uh, for sharing their time and expertise with us. You're welcome. Um, and yeah, just in the, in, if we didn't answer your questions, please reach out to us. You've got the, the information right there. Uh, and I hope you do. I hope to see you all again soon. I will go ahead and end the session now if I can figure out how to do so. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Oh, I'll shoot.